Welcome to another episode of A Drink with John. This is part of our special series sponsored by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and their Fortnight for Freedom campaign. That's an annual effort to promote awareness of and respect for uh, religious freedom, both here in the United States and also around the world. Here's how you know that the U.S. bishops are in deadly earnest about this effort this year. They have given us these lovely Fortnite for Freedom mugs. Uh, and because it is almost 6 o'clock here in Rome, we are right smack dab in the middle of happy hour. So I am enjoying a, uh, a beer while we talk. Uh, but uh, our guest today is actually in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, where it is still the middle of the day. So probably not having a beer quite yet. Uh, but uh, but don't be thrown off by that because uh, the person we are going to be talking to today is remarkable uh, in almost every sense of the word. We're talking about someone who graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy with a degree in physics, uh, who grew up actually as a Lutheran uh, and then converted to Catholicism, uh, who then went on to become a, a Rhodes Scholar then uh, a Catholic priest, now a Catholic monsignor, and now the president of Donnelly College uh, in Kansas City, Missouri. Really one of the most interesting and captivating personalities on the American Catholic stage, Monsignor Stuart Swetland. Monsignor, thank you so much for being with us here today. It's great to be with you, John. Yes, my staff wouldn't let me. It's mid-morning, so I can't uh, uh, have the beer yet, but thank you, and it's good to be with you. Yeah, we're building to that point in the day, Monsignor, so don't worry. You'll have earned it uh, after this is over. Now, uh, listen, I mean, I know you are well-versed in so many things. I mean, you know, I, I would love to have three hours just to cover all kinds of things with you, but unfortunately, we don't have that kind of time because you've got a university to run and, and other things to do. But because this video series uh, is, uh, is part of the USCCB's Fortnite for Freedom campaign, and let's begin with a question on religious freedom. Uh, I know you are well versed in Catholic social teaching, so just talk to us if you can uh, about where religious freedom fits in to uh, the broader sort of range uh, of concerns that are expressed in Catholic social teaching and why religious freedom from a Catholic point of view is such a cherished value. Right. Well, it's a cherished value because it flows from who we are as beings created in the image and likeness of God. Uh, the dignity of the human person means that in the very heart of who we are, we have the ability to both choose and that means to love and to know and to exercise both of those uh, godlike abilities. Uh, we freely get to choose how we understand God to be and our relationship with God. Now, we hope to proclaim in an efficacious way the truth about how God is as a trinity of persons who loves us so much that he calls us into intimate relationship with him. But we recognize that every human person has to come to understand and to say, yes, we hope to God's offer of relationship on their own. And there can be no coercion in this area if it's to be a true free act. So the dignity of the human person demands that we respect the right to religious freedom. Now, in the Catholic understanding of rights, which we, quite frankly, came to late in the game as far as our intellectual development, um, the idea of rights always also entails duties. We have the right to religious freedom, which means we have the duty to exercise that right and exercise it well, which means we have the duty to seek religious truth, and once we have discovered religious truth, to live those truths. So the right to religious freedom entails also the duty to seek religious truth and once known and grasped to as best we can live that truth. This is why part of what religious liberty is all about is the important aspect of formation and education. Yeah, now, you know, you, you mentioned the, the, that rights always come with duties. Um, the, the U.S. bishops began this Fortnite for Freedom campaign because they were alarmed by what they saw, what they described at the time, as a worrying erosion of religious freedom in the United States. Uh, and, of course, the corresponding duty to respect that religious freedom would be lodged in the first instance, I suppose, uh, with the American government. 
what's your own observation on this one, Senior? I mean, do, do you believe that there is a worrying erosion of religious freedom in the United States? Uh, and if so, what is the government not doing to protect religious freedom that it ought to be doing? Right. Well, first, I say I have to say I'm more worried about the gross violations of religious freedom internationally. Uh, you know, when you see what our brothers and sisters in Christ are suffering in places like Vietnam and China and places like the Muslim world, where you see the, the gross violation of religious freedoms in uh, Miramar and so many other places that whatever we can say about the United States, we are nowhere near those just catastrophic violations of human rights, crimes against humanity that so many of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ are suffering and other religions that are being persecuted in various parts of the world. But here in the United States, where we had a government uh, historically that encouraged religious practice, that uh, you know made it easier for people to uh, participate in their religious beliefs and fully respected the rights of conscience when it came to the exercise of those religious beliefs, has pulled back to some extent. Uh, in our society, uh, the, the, the Sabbath was something that was very well respected historically. And uh, therefore, uh, it was a slower day. Things were closed and people were uh, encouraged to uh, gather as family and friends and to worship uh, the so-called blue laws. And those have gone um, by the, you know, the way of all flesh and have disappeared in most places in the United States. But what is more worrying is that respect for conscience, especially in the healthcare field and in other areas where uh, historically there was a great understanding that there was a robust understanding of the human person and the exercise of religious freedom in the healthcare field. Now, many people are being pressured either subtly or not so subtly in that field to compromise their values and beliefs if they're gonna practice freely as pharmacists, doctors, nurses, um, uh, managers of healthcare facilities, et cetera. The government would like us to conform to a secular ethic that doesn't have the robust protections of the human person that we have in Catholic doctrine. Monsignor, you mentioned the, the distinction between the religious freedom challenges that we face in the United States and the ones abroad. You know, uh, anti-Christian persecution is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. I've written a book on it. Uh, I've covered it fairly extensively over the years. Uh, you know, I was just uh, a couple of days ago with Pope Francis in Egypt, where the Coptic Christian Church in Egypt is facing enormous strains. Uh, that, that papal trip actually unfolded under the shadow of the bombings of two Coptic Christian churches on Palm Sunday, one in the Nile Delta, one in Alexandria, that left 45 people dead. And, and that is just the tip of the iceberg uh, of what's going on around the world. Uh, you know, as Pope Francis always says, there are more Christian martyrs today by some order of magnitude than in the early centuries of the church. If we are truly concerned about religious freedom, I mean, would you agree that solidarity, concrete efforts at, at, at helping uh, our suffering brothers and sisters in the faith around the world, that, that that has to be an absolute priority, doesn't it? It does. I'm, excuse me there, that phone went off, which I didn't know it was even on. Um, the, um, I'm gonna pause, sorry, John. Um, the, um, it is an order of magnitude, and it is something, the 20th century, as many have pointed out, was the bloodiest of centuries in many different levels, including the level of uh, religious, uh, the persecution of religious minorities and the killing of people because of their religious belief. We just have to look at communism and what it did in uh, the various places that it was attempting. Um, and, you know, in the United States, our history of religious liberty uh, we've always had minor, if you will, uh, irritations. I can't even call them persecutions. Just the way we fund our schools is, as the Second Vatican Council pointed out in Dignitas Humanae, a system that would only fund government-run schools where religious practice is not allowed uh, and do nothing to help those who want to bring their children up uh, fully educated, informed in religious belief and with an integrated education, that that's an unjust system of, of public funding of education and we've lived with that the entirety existence of our of our um, of our church here in the United States but it's so minor compared to the the uh, the real persecution uh, the deadly persecution going on and our solidarity shouldn't just be something that we pray about and that we think about that's important it should also uh, have concrete actions for our government when it comes to its um, its foreign policy with nations that are not respecting religious liberty or worse 
uh, actively persecuting religious minorities. I think we should be much more vocal in how we deal with China, for example, when it comes to their relationship. Uh, recently, as you know, John, bishops uh, from our church have been arrested. They were kept from celebrating the Triduum. They were kept from celebrating their their um, uh, their um, you know um, their celebrations. Their priests for the for the Triduum. Uh, there, uh, there's underground bishops who are um, not able to exercise fully uh, their government, uh, their governing of their diocese in China, and that's our largest trading partner in many ways. So there's things that we can do and should be doing uh, to show our solidarity with those who are being persecuted. All right, well, let's broaden things out for a moment, Monsignor, because uh, I know that the Catholic social teaching generally uh, is a passion of yours and something that you've thought very carefully about. You know, when we talk about Catholic social teaching, we often talk about it as a sort of peace and justice tradition, that the, that the church is advocating peace and justice in the world. In fact, the, you know, the office in the Vatican that used to be in charge of Catholic social teaching was called the Pontifical Council for Peace and Justice. It's now been folded into a new kind of super dicastery. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, talk, can you talk for a minute about those two terms, peace and justice, right. in terms of what, it, what the church is seeking for the world. And, you know, are they truly synonymous? Uh, you know, what, what do those two words mean through Catholic eyes? Uh, and are there times, Monsignor, where, where the interest of peace and the interest of justice may not neatly align? Well, you know, there's old adage in Thomistic thinking, seldom affirm, never deny, always distinguish. And we need to do some distinguishing here. Uh, first of all, it's very important when we talk about Catholic social teaching, uh, lots and lots of people make the mistake of thinking that it's something extra to the faith, that it's sort of over there, uh, and it's not a constituent element of the gospel. Apollo 6, Blessed Apollo 6, was adamant about this, and he was right. Catholic social teaching is a constituent element of the gospel. So if we're not proclaiming it, and we're not trying to live it, we're not fully embracing and living the gospel. So it's part of the gospel. And so it's a, a essential that we understand it and try to live it. And it often is summarized as our teachings on peace and justice, as we need intellectually to, to talk about it in a particular way, because those two terms encompass so much of what Catholic social teaching is about. So uh, first of all, let's take the term justice. A just society is a society where every person has free and ready access to the goods that they need to participate in to fulfill their vocation and in life. So uh, when we say free and ready, it doesn't mean it's, it's monetarily free. It means it's there's no impediment that keeps someone from participating in the goods that perfect them as persons. Uh, this is clearly seen, for example, in Galman says paragraph 26, when it talks about the common good, because a just society is pursuing the common good, the good of all, each and every individual and the whole, the common good, which is that sum total of conditions necessary for everyone to have ready access to the goods that they need to participate in to fulfill their vocation. An obvious one is what we were talking about before, education. Everyone needs education and formation to fulfill their vocation, to discover their vocation. And we should have free and ready access for everyone in our society to education up to the level of their ability to uh, facilitate what it is God's calling them to do and be. And that's a common good that should be pursued. So a just society uh, pursues this. Now, another way of looking at that virtue uh, is to think of it the way that legal scholars think about it. Legal scholars think about it as following the law. But we know often following the law does not lead to the most just situation. Um, and so as philosophers, we talk about justice as giving each person his or her due. And that's a good definition as far as it goes. But as Christians, Jesus revealed to us uh, something beyond just giving each person his or her due. Uh, as the um, former, uh, now passed away, the Jesuit theologian Walter Bruckhock has said, for Christians, justice is fidelity to relationships. In Christ, we become brothers and sisters. And therefore, for us, justice is living out that family relationship we have with, with all persons, either in fact, because they are a brother and sister in Christ, or in potential, because there are people we can invite in to the family. And the way we treat each other in a family it's much different than the way we treat each other when we're not in the family. Once we recognize that we all should think of each other as part of a large family, the family of God, then we, we're willing to go the extra mile to uh, offer more than just what someone is due, but 
but in fidelity or relationship with them, make sure that they can flourish. So that's what justice is. Now, part of that, obviously, is it's hard for any of that to be achieved if we're not in a state of peace. So most people, when they hear the term peace, they think of the absence of war. And while that's peace at a level, it's not the kind of peace that the church understands in, the, in our Catholic social teaching. What we pursue when we, uh, uh, what we um, pursue when we pursue peace in our in Catholic social teaching is we pursue what Saint Augustine called uh, the tranquility of order. That means that not only is there no war, but there is a level of justice, so that everyone does have uh, the ready access to the goods they need to fulfill their vocation. And so, peace and justice go together. Peace is part of justice. Uh, because without it, you can't pursue almost anything. But we shouldn't uh, think that uh, if just because there's no war, we've gotten um, we've gotten where we need to be. And and that, of course, is precisely what uh, Blessed Pope Paul VI meant when he said, "If you want peace, work for justice." Right. Uh, right. That ultimately, creating a just society is the necessary condition for maintaining a durable peace. Exactly, and 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 where there is injustice, it's going always to lead to unrest because eventually people rightfully demand that which is uh, part of what they need uh, if they're to fulfill who they're called to be. Now, listen, we are almost out of time, but I can't let you go without asking you this question because, of course, mm -hmm. you know, as I said at the top, you're a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. You actually served uh, on an American nuclear submarine at one point in your life. I know you have thought very carefully about the Catholic just war tradition and how that applies to the nuclear age. So I want to ask you about the current situation we find ourselves in vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, uh, where President Trump uh, has talked about the possibility of what he describes as a major conflict uh, with North Korea, where we uh, North Korea is conducting ballistic missile tests. You know, the, many people are worried that we are on a brink of a major conflict. Through Catholic eyes, Monsignor, how should Americans be thinking about what is happening right now uh, in terms of North Korea and what our country's policies ought to be? We, I just was uh, talking with a group of military officers from Leavenworth about this. We uh, ignore the just war tradition at our peril. Uh, not only is it would be perilous for us as a uh, as a political reality, but it'd be parallel for us in the sense we put our souls at risk. The just war tradition grew up as a response to the reality that there are evil people that want to oppress and and invade and destroy uh, and and usurp. And we we'd be naive not to think that we need to defend true innocence from real aggressors. However, the just war tradition has put. Uh, and developed through space and time uh, because the wisdom of humanity says almost always when war is waged, more, more uh, damage is done than good achieved. And so there should be a very high threshold uh, to uh, any decision to use deadly force, be that in an individual situation like an officer, police officer on his or her beat, or a nation contemplating the use of deadly force in a military conflict. And one thing that, that has, we know for so, certain, preventative war, uh, a war of prevention is not a just cause for war. There has to be an, an imminent threat of real attack or an actual invasion already underway uh, for us to have a just cause to go to war. Unfortunately, this in the 21st century, this idea that we can wage a war of prevention uh, has become a uh, popular in certain circles, and I think it has led us into disastrous choices. St. John Paul II begged our nation and our allies not to go to war in the early 21st century with Iraq. Uh, we argued we needed to do so because of the preventative possibility of the misuse of weapons and mass destruction. What we've seen in retrospect that St. John Paul II was correct. Uh, we should not have waged that war. This idea that we might have to do a preventative or presump uh, uh, you know, this presumptive war to stop something bad that could happen down the road is a very dangerous idea. And we should be very cautious that the only way we enter into a, a, a conflict is because there is an imminent threat or a real uh, th a threat to innocent human life. 
Monsignor, here. Listen, I mean, it, you are one of the most interesting, one of the most compelling voices, I think, uh, in Catholic conversation in the United States these days. Among other things, because you have this unique ability to straddle left-right divides, because it is so clear that you're not coming from the political left or the political right. You're coming from your commitment to Catholic doctrine, to Catholic faith, to Catholic practice, Catholic social teaching. Uh, and so uh, we are extraordinarily grateful that you were willing to, to share some of that expertise and some of that life experience with us here today. Thank you so much. It's always great to be with you, John. Keep up your great work. So you have been listening to Monsignor Stuart Swetland, president of Donnelly College in Kansas City, Missouri. I am John Allen. This has been another episode of A Drink with John brought to you by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and their Fortnight for Freedom campaign. Please be watching this site for additional installments in this series. Uh, and until that happens, have a great and blessed day.